Welcome to the Doyen of Death podcast, funeral planning for those who don't plan to die. It's all about end-of-life issues and getting the conversation started about our 100% mortality rate. This series is hosted by Gail Rubin, certified thanatologist and the Doyen of Death. A Doyen is a woman who's considered senior in a group and knows a lot about a particular subject. So here to talk about the subjects we sometimes avoid is author, speaker, and the Doyen of Death, Gail Rubin. of Death podcast. I'm Gail Rubin, the doyen of death, your host with the most. We are talking about end-of-life issues on the doyen of death podcast. Uh, Doyen is a woman considered senior in a group who knows a lot about a particular subject, and I am thrilled to have with me here today Chris Palmer. He's the author of a new book called Achieving a Good Death. A Practical Guide to End of Life. There it is. Uh, so, Chris, welcome. Thank you. Nice to, nice, to, nice to be here. And I just want to say, before we start, Gail, what a fabulous book you wrote here. You've got oh. it behind you, and I want to hold it up. I just love it. I read it many years ago, and it's, 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 it's held up so well over the years. You did a terrific job, and congratulations. Thank you. Yes. Well, in fact, I was thinking about doing a second edition because a lot's changed since it first came out in 2010. Ooh, that was a while ago. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk initially about how would you define a good death? A good death, Gail, in my opinion, is what a person wants. And so, for some people, that might mean lots of, you know, over-medicalization. They might mean a hip replacement within a week of death. It, it, you know, it, 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 but for me, it doesn't. For me, it means a peaceful, gentle death surrounded by my loved ones and family, um, preferably at home if that's possible. So, but ever, I want to point out here that everybody has their own definition. There's no, there's no right way or wrong way of doing it. If somebody wants to put a priority on longevity, which many doctors sadly do, but if they want to put a, a you know, if they want to say that, how long I live matters to me than the quality of my life, then they have a right to do that. And I, and, and, and no, you know, no one can take that away. Ever. So, but having said that, the, the, a good death in general for most people is a gentle death, a pain free death, a death without regrets, you know, a death without, um, suffering and ideally without nausea, constipation, <laughs> delirium, uh, and, and, and ideally not in an ICU with, with tubes coming out of every orifice and a peg feed and intubation and ventilation, none of that. I mean, th so, th for, so for me, a good death is a peaceful, gentle, uh, gentle death. And if our listeners don't know, a good way to achieve that is if you recognize you've got a terminal illness to go on hospice. And um, I've personally had five loved ones die on hospice in the past year and a half. And yeah, it's, it's nice to not have to deal with all those tubes and beeping and hospitalization. It can be, it's, it's so hard. I so agree with you, Gail, and, and, and I, I serve on a hospice board. It's a wonderful service. I'm a hospice volunteer, and um, it's, it's a great thing, and, um, uh, you know, it, it's not used enough, and people come in it too late. Doctors are, af are afraid to recommend it because they don't want to admit failure. No, no, try this treatment. Try it. Let's do this. Let's do this. And, and, and you know, people tend to be respectful of doctors, even though doctors may not have your own best interests in heart, may not even have talked to you about what you want to do, may not even know you very well, know what your values are. And so, um, so anyway, get, get best if you're, in a, if you're in a terminal condition, have less than six months to live. Yes, hospice is an is a great thing to do. Yeah, and even then, um, I I was just talking to a girlfriend of mine. Her mother is ninety four. She's in an assisted living place, 
but she is still full code. If she has, you know, if her heart stops, she wants CPR. And oh my God, you don't want that when you're 94 years old. That is crazy. That is just crazy because uh, a lot of people don't may not realize that CPR um, involves a lot of violence. I mean, it means the chest is compressed by two inches. Especially for older people, frail older people, this can, as you know, Gail, better than anybody else, this can lead to broken ribs and a, and a damaged sternum and defibrillators can burn the skin. It's a terrible, violent thing. And most people come out, don't come out of it very well and, and don't have long to live afterwards. So to have full code on a knife year old, to me, is madness. It's insane. It's torture. Um, and and uh, so uh, that needs to be <laughs> rethought. You're, go- you're, go- you're free. Yeah. I, I know she tries to, uh, you know, encourage her mother to change it to, you know, do not resuscitate or allow natural death. But that would that would mean admitting you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's and that and that is very hard for you know. One reason I wrote my book, Gail, is because I was scared of dying. I was scared isn't strong enough. Petrified. I mean, and and so uh, now I'm now seventy seven. When I got into my sixties, I realized, gosh, this you know, I'm going to die. Especially because we have a lot of death in our family. My my father died of prostate cancer. My mother died of heart disease. My three brothers all died of heart of heart failures, heart failure, and I am going to die of of heart failure. Which is a horrible way to die, um, and um, so I wanted to confront this and deal with it, learn about it. So I started studying it and talking about it and researching it, and and um, and so I, I'm still scared of it. But having written this book, achieving a good death, um, I am. I think I'm. I can fairly say that I'm less scared. So I've learned more about it. Learned what you can do to to have a good death, and um, learned that one has options. It isn't just uh, you know uh, just whatever happens happens. No, you can have some influence over uh, over how you die, and so. Um, so that's why I wrote the book because I was scared of it. My family, I'd witnessed some very bad deaths, and um, and so this book is designed to help people die well. It's called Achieving a Good Death, and that's what it does. The subtitle is a practical guide to the end of life, and it says it is just exactly that. It deals with green burial and medical aid and dying, and 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 you know, and advanced directives and dementia riders and de death cleaning and all these things that one need to know about uh, to have a good death. Well, and are there maybe one or two things that people could easily do to help their loved ones uh, before they yes. die? Yeah. Yes. Yes. They, they, yes, they are. And so um, the, um, the the one thing um, is to have a um, a, a conversation. Uh, I told Gawande calls it the hard conversation, but have a conversation with your loved ones about what you would like. Very important because uh, often at the end of life, we cannot talk for ourselves. And so you loved ones need to talk for you, uh, including your health care um, agent. So I think um, having a, um, having a, um, an, a, um, this conversation with your with your family, telling them how you want to die, having an advanced directive, um, and very important now is having a dementia rider to that advanced directive. So 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 your loved ones know how you what you want at the end of your life. They're not left uh, after you've become comatose or unable to speak. They're not left thinking, oh my God, what would Chris want? What, what would dad want? What would grandpa want? They know he wrote it down that he talked to me about it. And so that's a source of comfort. That's, that's one thing to do. Um, the, another thing I would say to ease, um, help loved ones uh, is to death clean. Don't leave your house in a complete mess. Um, you know, I I have a friend who was furious. He loved her mom, but was furious with her because when she died, her house was a complete disaster. And her daughter, my friend, uh, was angry because she had spent about a full year 
and she's busy with a life of her own, but she has spent a whole year cleaning out her mum's apartment. This is not a, not a, you know, you want people to be thinking about you in a positive way, not to be angry at you, even though she loved her mum, she adored her mum, but she was angry at her. So all this is to say, get organized, clean things out, you know, get rid of clutter. So that's another thing uh, to do. And I would say uh, another thing to do to help people after your death is to produce and write an ethical will, sometimes called a legacy letter. This is a lovely thing to do. And it, beca- and it, it becomes or can become a tre- cherished, treasured heirloom, a letter from you to your loved ones. It might just be, a, you know, a page, a couple of pages, could be, could be longer. Um, but but it, what, it, what it, an ethical will is a, is a letter to your survivors, to your heirs, to your children, to your nephews, nieces, to your neighbors, doesn't, who, it, you know, could be to anybody, telling them why they matter what matters to you, why you love them, thanking them for what you did for, what they did for you. And, and, um, uh, it can contain uh, stories, contain life lessons. It can, they can vary uh, in style and content quite a lot, but it's a, it's a letter which describes um, uh, what you've learned from life, what you want your survivors to to learn from your life, and is basically a love letter. So that's a lovely um, thing thing to do. And then I'd say, fourthly, very quickly, is another thing you can do to help your loved ones after you die is to leave a what I call a death will. This is a um, this is a letter, a document which describes how you want your body to be disposed of and how you want to be celebrated. Whether you want a funeral, a memorial service, what type of memorial service, where, and this again. This type of thing is so helpful to survivors because instead of being in a panic when they've got to get the death certificate, they've got to talk to the funerals home, they've got to do a home funeral, they've got whatever they're doing. In addition, they've got to work. They got, they, you don't want them to have to say to themselves, "Oh, what did Grandpa want? I have no idea." You know, I have no idea. No, help them out. You know, leave a leave a brief letter telling them in a in a death will what you'd like. One of the uh, things that I like to do teaching people about planning ahead for end of life is using film clips and television clips that illustrate these ideas. And I don't know if you're familiar with the Kaminsky method that was on Netflix, but, um, a little bit, a tiny bit. Oh, you should watch it. It's, uh, it's funny, but it's all about the issues of aging. And it includes a letter from this woman who has died She had cancer, so she had time to think about what she wanted. And she dictated what she wanted very specifically with her funeral. And uh, it gave her husband something to do, something to glom Mm. onto, guidance. But, but, you know, there was also this, I mean, it was so specific. You kind of got to think about, you know, how much of a, dictator do you want to be about your final arrangements but one way that i encourage people is to actually pre-plan with a funeral home you don't necessarily need to prepay but that can be very helpful when the time comes if you can afford it um they also you know allow you to pay like an insurance policy is generally how it's done so that you still own your money but uh, it can lock in today's rates for a funeral. And I have saved thousands of dollars uh, with pre-planning funerals for my loved ones who have died. So that's, that's, that's what, yeah. The uh, first one, the Kaminsky thing. Yeah. That's with these two old uh, male actors, the famous yeah. actors, right? Uh, yeah. Michael, uh, saw... Michael Douglas and Alan Arkin. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I have seen it and I, I think highly of it. And, uh, and that's so funny. The story you tell about the, 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 the woman um, uh, giving detailed instructions. Yeah. You don't want to be too much of a dictator. The thing to remember, of course, is that it has, it's, 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 it's celebrating the, the deceased, but it's also comforting the living. So you need to uh, deal with both. And then I agree totally with, with pre-planning. I um, actually recommend against um, pre-paying. So it's interesting to hear what you said about that, about saving money. So so maybe I'm, you know, maybe there, there's another side of that. I, I know the Funeral Consumers Alliance uh, recommends pre-planning, but not pre-paying. But, uh, yeah. but we can talk more about that. But um, uh 
I, I think what, I like what you said, Gail, very much about about um, uh, you know planning, going to a funeral home, talking about it, seeing what they seeing what the services they offer, seeing if you like them. Don't leave it to the end. Do it early on and compare between funeral. I mean the the amount the the difference in price even within a city. Can be as much can be much as uh, as as uh, a four thousand percent. So there's huge difference in prices uh, between different similar for the same service between different funeral homes. So good to shop around. That's what I say. Shop before you drop. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. One of the other things that you talk about is well, you've talked about different letters, uh, ethical will letter. And in fact, the ethical will, when you talk about a, um, uh, a f- will and testament, the testament was the ethical will part uh, of a will. Uh, you know, your, your property part of the distribution was the will, and uh, the testament was the ethical will. But um, when... When we talk about quality of life over quantity of life, I think that's a very important concept that a lot of people are are loath to actually think about. What do you think about that? Well, um, I well, I, I you know you've helped people, Gail, all over the world think about this, and I commend you for your for your work, and and um, I think um, uh, I think people need to think seriously about. Um, uh, hastening their deaths at the end of life. Um, we're talking about people who are old, who are near the end of death. So we're not talking about suicide, nothing like that. We're simply talking about how to avoid pain and extreme pain and suffering. And and if people get to a point in their lives uh, where they're el- o- older, elderly, and, and, and they are suffering unbearably, they should be given the option, have the option, um, it falls under patient-directed care, they have the option of hastening their deaths. They can do this through through just stopping or withdrawal uh, from life-sustaining, life-sustaining treatments, which is completely legal, and and, and or they can they can uh, what's called VSED, voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. They can practice VSED because people stop eating anyway as they get to the end of their life, and so it's just that's a very natural thing to do. Or they can use. Uh, uh, lethal medications like medical aid in dying where it is legal is now legal in about 11 jurisdiction juris- jurisdictions um, just fail in Delaware sadly um, uh, it's and, legal um, here in New Mexico <laughs> yeah 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 and here in, and in DC near me and um, so um, um, or you could, of course you can go to Switzerland um, and um where they have more progressive laws, but it still has to be self-administered. You you know you you can't get euthanasia in in uh, in Switzerland, but you but it has to be self-administered. And and uh, medically in dying, as you know, it has to be six months within uh, of death of, of death um, certified by a doctor, and it has to be self-administered, as I said. So um, and you have to have obviously uh, mental capacity, uh, decision-making capacity. So um, so. Um, so I think people should be given the option of, if they want to, um, I, I don't believe anyone has the right to take take that away from people. If they want to hasten their death by a few days, I think they should be allowed to do so. Yeah. So as we're coming to a close here, uh, any last thoughts you'd like to share with us about this whole field yes. and, and your book? Yes, well, thank you, Gail. So um, I, I want to um, I want to encourage people to 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 look to look at my book. Get it from like all proceeds from the, from my book goes to fund scholarships. I, none of it comes to me. All or from I've written ten books. My tenth book. They all all the proceeds go to fund student scholarships. My wife and I set up a fifty thousand dollar scholarship at an American University. I would say a couple of things in, as we close out here. One is that um, uh, one of the chapters in my book is called live well to die well. And I don't think that gives generally enough attention. And that is that if you live well, if you have good friends, if you live a giving life, if you live a life with thriving and healthy relationships, if you have a strong family, if you do good, if you if you, uh, fight, if you uh, uh, fight for social justice, all these things, if you do this, you are more likely, you can't, no guarantee, but more likely to have a better, better uh, a death. So I would say that. And, um, 
You've already talked about um, hospice. And, and I, well, one thing we haven't mentioned is end-of-life doulas. I, I, I believe strongly, and I'd like to see end-of-life doulas embedded more in hospice so they can, because hospice um, is very good, but doesn't always have the time to give to dying people because they're, you know, Medi, uh, Medicare doesn't allow, doesn't allow it financially. Um, and, um, and the last Explain thing I would say... a little bit about death doulas, end-of-life doulas. Yes, so... End of life doulas are people who are not medically trained, but they are licensed and trained to be companions, companions and, and comforters, and they can help people write ethical wills, legacy letters, or they can help them, um, you know, they can uh, help maybe massage nice emoluments into people's hands if, they, if that's what they want. You know, they can be a comfort to people. So a death, they're sometimes called death doulas, I call them end of life doulas, but they, they basically spent time, much more time than a hospice can give you and um and they can help you uh, just be more comfortable and 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 sort of um happier as you come to the end of life they play a very important uh, role and of course um death doulas can also help after death um uh, called hope guidance doulas or uh, um or, or, or yeah, they call it, they're called death doulas as well. Or home um, funerals things like home that. Home funeral guides, thank yeah. you. Home yeah. funeral guides and and they can be um Home funeral guides can be very helpful after death to the family, uh, helping just clean up and, and help organize things. So, so those two, so death doulas can play a very important role. Yeah. So we're talking with Chris Palmer, author of Achieving a Good Death, A Practical Guide to the End of Life. And uh, I'm sure it's available on all the outlets one would usually find a book. Uh, do you have a website uh, that people I can do. check out? Thank you, Gail. ChrisPalmerOnline.com. Chris Palmer online.com and you find lots of handouts there free handouts on all sorts of subjects to do with end of life uh, so people can help themselves uh, to to those um, and and before we go I want to recommend to any listeners and people watching Gail's Gail's own book uh, a good goodbye a super, an excellent read and I highly recommend it oh thank you Chris so we've been talking again with Chris Palmer, author of Achieving a Good Death, and I would like to encourage all of you to remember, just like talking about sex won't make you pregnant, talking about funerals won't make you dead, start a conversation today. Thank you for joining us on the Doyen of Death podcast. You can find episodes of this podcast and past episodes of A Good Goodbye with Gail Rubin on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information on Gail's work, visit agoodgoodbye.com.